one sec. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to Welcome Home, The Rise of Ten Cities in the United States, a joint presentation of the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty and Yale Law School's Allard K. Lewinstein International Human Rights Clinic. Uh, we're very excited to be with you today. Um, we have presenting today uh, myself, the Director of Human Rights and Children's Rights Program at the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. My name is Eric Tars. We also have Stuart Van Leenen, an attorney uh, who helped us on a pro bono basis at Dickstein Shapiro. Um, several law students, Julie Hunter, Paul Linden Raytek, Serene Shabaya at Yale Law School, as well as their supervising attorney, Hope Metcalf. Today's presentation will include a brief introduction to 10 cities and the rise of them in the United States, along with some background information, uh, an in-depth look at four case studies that the law students conducted in four cities across the country, uh, and small discussion of some of the applicable legal standards at the international, regional, and domestic level, as well as comparative examples from other countries of how those countries have addressed 10 cities in those countries as well as recommendations that we would make in terms of how cities can best deal with these, uh, uh, the growth of 10 cities in this country. As an initial matter, I'd like to note that the Law Center does not necessarily endorse the growth of 10 cities. We view it as a facial uh, example of a violation of the human right to housing in the United States. Tents are not adequate housing. However, where they do exist, cities and there are inadequate resources to otherwise house homeless people in those cities, uh, cities should take a constructive approach to these uh, encampments, uh, not criminalize their existence and uh, even provide them with basic services such as uh, sanitation or water and try to ensure that the people who are living there have as best access as possible to, um, to services in order that they can live as dignified an existence as possible. We have noted that uh, homelessness and homeless encampments have been increasing over the past number of years with the uh, economic crisis. Um, but even before then, lack of affordable housing across our country, the lack of adequate shelter space, criminalization of homelessness, um, and a focus on pushing people out of visible areas of cities, um, as well as a lack of participation of homeless individuals in coming up with solutions to their own situations, and a lack of overall political will for sustainable solutions have all contributed to the rise of 10 cities across the country. I'm going to uh, introduce Stuart right now to give us a brief uh, overview of the survey that uh, his firm conducted on behalf of the Law Center. Stuart. Thank you, Eric. My team at Dickstein conducted a media survey of 10 cities across the U.S. Uh, from 2008 through April 2012. We searched the terms tent city and homeless camp uh, together with the, uh, the name of the state. We found over 100 encampments were reported in 41 of 51 jurisdictions, including the District of Columbia. A minority of those states, only eight, only eight sites were legal. The majority of sites were evicted uh, in this time period. Many evicted sites moved to a new location, particularly, for instance, in Hawaii. Conditions at the tent cities varied dramatically. Uh, one particularly troubling story I read was uh, of a site underneath a highway, uh, underneath a California highway. Uh, that The site was like a cave. Uh, there were drug needles, uh, weapons, uh, garbage strewn around, uh, certainly not conditions for human habitation. Other sites were more remote and forested. Uh, one uh, site of particular interest was in Ontario, California. That site was somewhat of a victim of its of its own success. Um, it was large, sanctioned, 
had access to uh, sanitation and water, and over a very short time frame, the population there ballooned to over 400 people, at which point the authorities there decided that they needed to reduce the numbers, uh, which they did, to less than 200 uh, by requiring the residents there to show that they were, in fact, residents of on Ontario. And so there was, um, I guess, a lot of bad blood created amongst those that were basically kicked out. Other sites, uh, like River Haven Ventura, are really a model for how a, a tent city should be run. Um, it was s small. Each of the, uh, the tent structures are of, a, I guess, a semi-permanent nature. Uh, the program is tightly run, and for those who had jobs and could afford it, they were even paying rent. Another contrast is in the tent cities in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, again, dirty, lawless, dangerous, and, and violent. And so what we've seen in a number of these tent cities and homeless camps is obviously poverty as well as drugs, crime, lack of cleanliness, and uh, security issues associated with unmonitored sites. Uh, the best sites that we saw were when they were sanctioned and some sort of third party, where there was a governmental agency, um, or something like the Catholic Charities was involved and set rules uh, that much uh, better conditions existed. Back to you, Eric. Thanks, Stuart. And I, I would also point out that um, in the situations where uh, newspaper coverage was received, um, you know that could be because those were the more notorious or notable ones, um, whereas many tent cities who are existing on a more uh, unsanctioned but unremarkable basis, not a problem in the community, might not receive as much news coverage. So uh, this survey was based purely on those um, sites that were actually covered in the media. Yes, uh -huh. Eric, that's a, that's a good point. And I, I did want to add that um, we got the sense that we're, there were many more tent cities out there than what we were able to identify through our media survey. Exactly. Um, I'd also uh, like to just make a note, forgot to do this at the beginning, that uh, we will be holding questions and answers to the end of the presentation. Um, because of the large number of people on the call, we aren't able to do that over the phone. However, um, on the sidebar that folks should see in front of them, there's a chat box. People can ask questions there. Um, and they'll be read out, and we will answer them at the end of the program. Uh, additionally, I'd like to note that um, this presentation is based on a report that we have uh, are in the midst of drafting, and um, the report should be coming out sometime in the next month or so. And if you are signed up for the webinar, you will get the notification uh, when that report is actually out. Um, but we wanted to give a little preview of the, the findings as we are having them. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to uh, the Yale team to talk about their findings. Okay, thanks. This is Serene um, from the Yale team. Uh, before we get going uh, talking about some of the specific case studies, I'm just going to say a couple of words about the methodology that we used um, to choose locations and also who we spoke to and et cetera. Um, at the time that we began our research, there was an existing report on West Coast tent cities, and we felt that the greatest gap was in kind of knowledge or information about tent cities on the East Coast, so we decided to focus our more in-depth research on a few locations in that area. Um, and we also kind of based on looking at the news reports that were out there, chose a few locations that we felt would provide a good representative sample um, of uh, tent cities. We, I'm sorry, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so 
we also tried in each location to speak to a combination of homeless or formerly homeless individuals, advocates, um, people who are service providers, as well as lawyers working with uh, homeless individuals. Um, but generally speaking, in the way that we portrayed our findings, we tried to kind of prioritize the voice of the homeless or formerly homeless individuals who relate their stories and their experiences um, living in the ten cities. Um, the first location we visited uh, was in Providence, Rhode Island, um, which was the location of two fairly large and sort of well documented in the media tent cities, one of which was Hope City and the other was Camp Runamuck. Um, around 2009-2010, um, the situation in Rhode Island, according to the advocates and uh, people that we spoke to, was pretty dire. There were not enough shelter beds. Um, there was a homeless person who, who froze to death in the streets um, in the winter around January of 2009. Um, and so at that time, a few people decided to set up a tent city, mostly out of necessity, but also partly out of protest. Um, and in the uh, initial, in the Hope City tent city, um, the policy there was that you could only join that, come to that tent city if you really literally had no other place to go. Um, and what they found was that um, a lot of people were coming, uh, especially people who couldn't otherwise access the shelter system, such as, for example, um, uh, people, couples or um, people who otherwise did not really fit in within the traditional emergency shelter system. Um, at around the same time, there were a few homeless couples um, led by John Freitas and Barbara Khalil um, who were just not able to find a way to live together in the shelter system. They felt that it was infantilizing, they felt that their needs were not met, um, and that they didn't have any kind of ability to have continuity or stability within the shelter system, and so they started pitching tents with a few other couples um, who were friends of theirs, um, and they kind of started uh, in a very small location and then uh, moved to a larger location after their numbers grew. Um, eventually, both of the tent cities were evicted. Um, the city filed a lawsuit in state court to get them out and won. Um, there are many more details um, in the report about this, but as a few brief takeaways, um, there was lack of shelter beds, um, there was a sense that homeless individuals were not treated with um, respect, were not able to, they, had no, they felt they had no, no autonomy or capacity to create a community life for themselves. Um, uh, there were also safety concerns around um, the available sort of spaces that, you could util that they could utilize, and this is sort of why they chose to begin encampments of their own and try to kind of set up, set up their own system for internal organization. And with Camp Renamuk in particular, um, the camp had a charter, uh, it had a very specific kind of hierarchical organization with elected leaders and a council and sort of procedures for monitoring behavior within the camp, um, and that sort of seemed to be fairly successful. Um, just a very quick look at the map, this is sort of the rough location of the two tent cities, um, which were kind of at catty corner from each other. Um, and then the two small photos that you see are actually the, uh, the first location where John Freitas and Barbara Khalil pitch a, pitched a tent. Um, and they were kind of pointing out to us the poignancy of the fact that it says that this is a shelter for persons distressed. But of course, that's one of the first places from which um, they, were event they eventually had to leave and vacate. Um, in Lakewood, New Jersey, this is actually the only location, or one of two locations we visited um, that has a currently existing Tent city. Um, the, Lakewood, the town of Lakewood is currently trying to evict them through a lawsuit, sort of similar to what took place in Rhode Island, but so far um, they have not been successful. Um, the tent city is located in the woods. Um, it has about 70 residents. It was started by a man named Minister Steve Brigham, who began helping people who came to him, telling him that they had no place else to go, they were homeless, they needed a solution. And so he began to sort of set them up in the woods, and slowly this grew to become the tent city that it currently is. Um, Minister Steve himself became homeless um, because he couldn't both keep a job and work with the community, and so he currently lives in tent city as well. Um, some of the background conditions here, uh, there is no shelter system in all of Ocean County. Uh, individuals get motel vouchers for limited periods of time as a form of emergency assistance. Um, but many individuals don't qualify for that form of assistance. So with the economic downturn, loss of jobs, lack of will on the part of the town, the county, and the state to provide the necessary assistance, homeless people had to kind of find their own um, 
their own solution. Um, and this is this took the form of Tent City, which, according to many of the people we talked to, has become housing of last resort for many in, in the Lakewood area. Um, so that even police officers and county officials sometimes refer individuals to Tent City when they become homeless for lack of other alternatives. Um, and again, the photos here, this is the rough location of the Tent City, of uh, the Lakewood Tent City. Um, and the two photos we chose, we chose just to illustrate how much people have invested, especially people who have been living in Tent City for a long time, just how much they've invested in kind of personalizing their tents, making a bit of a home out of them, and it kind of illustrates a little bit more of the sense of community and continuity that they have been able to achieve through um, living in Tent City. Our next case study focuses on tent cities in New Orleans. Um, between 2007 and 2011, there were two large tent cities and one large homeless camp in downtown New Orleans. And the first tent city started at Bunking Plaza, right across from City Hall, in July 2007. It was a result of longtime residents returning home, as well as a group called Homeless Pride, which was trying to bring attention to housing problems in New Orleans. By October 2007, the camp had swelled to over 250 full-time residents at which time Unity, which is a nonprofit collaborative of service providers, stepped up efforts to find housing for those homeless residents. Outreach workers moved many people to hotels and then permanent supportive housing using federal housing vouchers over the course of two months. In December, early December, the state attempted to fence off Sunken Plaza, but Unity managed to gain until December 21st to relocate the camp's homeless residents, moving a total of 249 people eventually from the camp into permanent supportive housing. At the same time, there was another camp um, growing under the intersection of Canal Street and Claiborne Avenue um, in a major area uh, section of New Orleans. This camp, unlike the Duncan Plaza camp, um, didn't really have any uh, organizational structure. It lacked security, and there were no sanitation facilities, which led to a, a serious situation with rotting food and a lot of health and disease issues. There were also drug dealers and criminal elements who would prey on the homeless people living in the camp and a lot of people with disabilities and medical conditions. Um, unfortunately, following the Duncan Plaza closure, um, there was a lack of housing vouchers available, and it wasn't until July 2008 that Unity was able to get more federal housing vouchers, um, at which point they housed another 200 people from the camp. There's a more recent homeless camp in New Orleans on Calliope Street, right across from the New Orleans Mission Homeless Shelter, which swelled to around 100 people in October 2011. And this time, the city of New Orleans led efforts and mobilized service providers um, to provide housing to around 85 people. Uh, since that time, it looks like more people have moved to the site at Calliope Camp, and there's around 40 people living there currently outside. The reason we focused on New Orleans was to, um, to look at how underlying factors common to many places, not just New Orleans, can lead to a homelessness crisis in the wake of some kind of precipitating factor. In this case, the, the factor was Hurricane Katrina and the failure of the levees and the resulting crises that occurred. But in other cases, it could be a financial downturn or a mortgage foreclosure crisis. And this is indeed what we found in other of our case studies. But some of the factors that we specifically looked at in New Orleans when we interviewed people included the, the type of economy. Um, in New Orleans' case, it's mostly a service-based economy with a lot of minimum and low-wage earners, certain specificities of the rental market, including discriminatory policies, especially against renters, and few rights for tenants, as well as a broken and corrupt housing authority. Uh, there was, we found that there was a severely inadequate um, mental care services availability and health care in general, which, which worsened the problems following Katrina. Um, the demolition of public housing and the rent spike following uh, the housing vouchers, vouchers being issued, leading to a general shortage of affordable housing. Um, also, criminalization and the high incarceration rates in Louisiana and New Orleans, uh, the criminalization of status crimes and survival behaviors of people without housing, and finally, the, the disruption of social ties and networks following an event like Katrina, meaning that people couldn't rely on their, their family and their extended family and friends to help them through this time. As in other places, tent cities and homeless encampments was just a visible tip of the iceberg. Uh, Unity estimates that the total number of people who lived at either the Duncan Plaza or the Canal and Claiborne camp was closer to around 2,000 people um, who were cycling through the camps, not necessarily staying permanently, but moving between the camps and abandoned buildings and friends' houses. Uh, it's estimated that there's around 12,000 people homeless annually in New Orleans, and 
And really the key takeaway is that homelessness in, in the form of the camps becomes visible and becomes treated as an emergency, but really it should always be treated as an emergency. Thanks, Julie. Uh, so our final case study was uh, Pinellas County and the city of St. Petersburg, Florida, where homelessness has been steadily increasing since 2003. The 2007 point in time count documented 5,200 homeless persons, but that's almost surely an undercount and has dramatically increased post-recession. St. Petersburg was an instructive case study both because of the severity of the situation of the city's homeless, as well as the diverse institutional response of the municipal authorities. From 2003 to 2006, after homelessness numbers increased and homeless persons formed various ad hoc communities in the downtown, the city sanctioned the creation of a temporary tent city adjacent to the St. Vincent de Paul shelter. This tent city quickly failed to accommodate the numbers of St. Petersburg's homeless population, and further tent communities were founded without official sanction in the surrounding area. One of these encampments was Operation Coming Up, comprising over 100 persons established by homeless individuals refuge ministries, and other local organizations. The encampment was governed directly by homeless persons. The group emphasized that the tent city was a temporary solution, an act of protest with a set of demands for the municipal authorities, including the opening of public bathrooms 24-7, safe places for homeless persons to sleep, a suspension of criminalization ordinances, more affordable housing, and greater participation by the poor and homeless in crafting solutions. Operation Coming Up was disbanded in, in, in January of 2007, following citations of code violations from the city, and a series of other tent cities were established over the following month, at the end of which the now infamous tent slashing incident occurred when police, using scissors and box cutters, slashed and seized over 20 tents. The incident was captured on tape and garnered national media attention. These developments also were occurring, were occurring against the backdrop of what Rain Johns, a public defender in Pinellas County, has described as a patchwork of ordinances, criminalizing in effect the visible existence of homeless persons. In the period of 2007 to 2008, the downtown no handling zone was expanded and ordinances were passed making sleeping in the right of way, placing temporary shelter on public property without a permit, and storing personal items on public property all unlawful. Activists and lawyers have made uh, various attempts to challenge the constitutionality of these ordinances, but most of these cases eventually settled out of court. Moreover, these ordinances have had the effect of forcing homeless persons north from Pinellas to Clearwater and to Pasco County where partially due to Pottinger, uh, similar ordinances are rarely enforced. In Pasco, in particular, activists estimate that thousands of people are living in the wooded, wooded areas without electricity or water, including 400 children. And this brings us to the two institutional responses of the city of St. Petersburg that were of particular interest to us. So first, in August 2007, and in cooperation with Catholic Charities and the Roman Catholic Diocese, St. Petersburg established Pinellas Hope, a fully institutionalized tent city with some 250 tents on site and with the aims of reducing street homelessness and transitioning uh, Pinellas Hope residents into permanent housing. The Pinellas Hope site is located 12 miles from the downtown, a distance uh, most residents have to walk each day. The site occupies swamp land with significant flooding during heavy rain, heat, and mosquitoes. Uh, tents are placed on wooden platforms and pathways are covered in mulch. And since opening, uh, Pinellas Hope has added semi-permanent single occupancy casitas for residents who have found employment have, and can pay a false small fee for more permanent housing. At the rear of the camp, Pinellas Hope 2 is under construction, which is a series of uh, single occupancy efficiency apartments as additional permanent transitional housing. Pinellas Hope is a dry shelter and admissions criteria require that applicants be sober and have no prior charges on the records. Breathalyzer tests and background checks are done before intake paperwork is started. Pinellas Hope is the only St. Pete shelter that does not require, that does not require um, uh, residents to sleep in dormitory settings with separate quarters for men and women. Pinellas Hope provides case management, alcohol, substance abuse uh, services, and other on-site services. And the second municipal intervention, mostly in response to the growing numbers of arrests of homeless persons, was Pinellas Safe Harbor, what we termed a correctionalized shelter. The city, in conjunction with the county, uh, county sheriff's department, converted a vacant minimum security jail annex into a shelter and a jail diversion program for homeless persons. Pinellas Safe Harbor opened in January 2011, and it's 15 miles uh, from downtown. Unlike Pinellas Hope, Safe Harbor is a wet shelter, meaning it will not turn people away if they come intoxicated or under the influence, or if they have criminal backgrounds. Safe Harbor includes 370 beds divided into four interior pods, 
and residents sleep on the floor on assigned mattresses, which are collected and sanitized each morning. Past residents lamented the prison structure and the regimented life in Safe Harbor, giving it the nickname the Jailter. Nevertheless, the defenders of the facility note that it takes uh, seriously its aim to change individual behavior and provides basic services effectively to people lacking them. While Pinnell's hope and to an extent Safe Harbor are in some senses positive steps to providing services to homeless persons, there remain deficiencies with a top-down approach that this kind of institutionalization of the tent city model represents. Many times activists noted that in the top-down context, there is an attached stigma to homelessness. There's an assumption that homeless persons are incapable of doing things for themselves. Instead, the homeless are defined as a bundle of needs. They're defined in the language of deficiencies. There must be a comprehensive plan to enable homeless persons to be self-sufficient when they leave the shelter system, and this goes beyond substance abuse and mental health issues. St. Pete homelessness advocate G.W. Rawl emphasizes that in addition to repealing anti-homeless ordinances, municipalities must change their mentality from recrimination or criminalization to constructive development. And that was really our main takeaway from St. Pete. Okay, um, we are going to go out of order here for a second. We're, uh, the next section we're going to be talking about um, international and regional law, domestic U.S. law, and a brief overview of some comparative um, studies that we did. Um, we're going to start with, um, with the domestic uh, U.S. law. In this report, we focused on um, federal law primarily. We also looked at state Supreme Court cases. Um, but um, what we're doing here is not a comprehensive listing of all the different cases, but rather more of an analysis um, to kind of complement the comprehensive um, summaries of all the cases, federal and state, that are in the 2011 um, Law Center report. Um, just from kind of looking at the cases that are out there, um, the it's a little bit of uncharted territory in some ways, particularly because there has not been a huge amount of litigation specifically on homeless encampments, and also because the decisions are fairly mixed. There are some differences in um, conclusions on sort of the same issues. Um, the cases can generally be classified into two broad buckets, um, the protest, the encampment as protest category, and the encampment as necessity category. Um, and this is kind of how they've come before federal courts, um, by and large. There are sort of three, again, substantive buckets, if you like. Um, the first is First Amendment, um, so challenges on the basis of the right to free exercise of religion and or the right to freedom of speech. There are cases that have uh, brought um, Fourth, Fifth, and Fourteenth Amendment challenges, um, so based on the right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures, the right to property, um, the rights not to be deprived of liberty or property without due process of law. And then there have been cases where Eighth Amendment and Fourteenth Amendment challenges have been brought on the basis that the criminalization of certain necessary survival activities um, of homeless individuals constitutes a violation of the Eighth Amendment. Um, under the First Amendment uh, bucket, one really good case that's kind of a good example to go to uh, is uh, the Second Circuit, Fifth uh, Avenue Presbyterian Church case. This case actually found that um, it was not about a homeless encampment, actually, but it was about a church that wanted to host homeless individuals on their property, and the city was trying to stop them from doing that, New York City in that case, um, and the court found that um, there was an undue burden of their right to free exercise of religion. And one of the obvious ways that this applies to tent cities is that um, if they are hosted by a religious organization, there may well be a First Amendment claim to say that they cannot be evicted or shut out. Um, and in fact, some states, one state Supreme Court in Washington has found under the Washington Constitution that a similar principle applies, that um, cities and states and towns cannot unduly burden a religious organization's uh, free exercise of religion by stopping it from hosting um, homeless individuals or a homeless in encampment on, on its property. Under the Fourth, Fifth, and Fourteenth Amendment bucket, there are a lot of cases relatively, I mean, not a, not a whole lot, but relatively a lot of cases, um, some of which are good, some of which are bad. Two particularly good um, examples of positive decisions in those uh, under that general bucket are Cash versus Hamilton um, and Johnson versus Board of Police Commissioners. Both of these cases found violations of homeless individuals' rights um, where either their property was taken and destroyed or they were harassed and arrested without cause um, or where, in, in a particularly egregious case in Johnson, where um, police would sort of 
suggest to homeless individuals that they perform um, community service in lieu of being arrested and charged. And the court found that that was actually a violation of the right against forced servitude. Um, under the sort of necessity and, and survival bucket, uh, one of the best examples, really, there are a few other cases out there that are similar, but a lot of them actually end up being vacated um, after settlement by the parties and things like that. So Pottinger is still sort of the best case out there on this. Um, in addition to finding fourth, fifth, and 14th Amendment violations, uh, the court in Pottinger also found an Eighth Amendment violation and said that cities may not enforce criminalization ordinances unless they provide alternatives, viable, or actually, unless they provide alternatives um, to homeless individuals. And it'll be interesting to watch whether this, would, this should mean something like a viable alternative or a, a satisfactory alternative or whether it's just um, any alternative. But one reason why it's really important to kind of stop at Pottinger is that uh, we really, when we were down in Florida, we could really feel the impact that that decision had had on the thinking of everybody who works with the homeless community there whether it was like the police chiefs or um, the town officials or even the service providers, there was a general sense that if we want to enforce our ordinances, we have to provide some alternatives. And this is where the jail tour that Paul was describing earlier kind of came out of, because of a sense that if we want to stop people from panhandling or doing various activities in the town center, we have to actually provide them with a place to go. Um, so in that sense, this is a very interesting decision. Uh, again, we haven't really, in this, in this report, we haven't focused on lower state courts. Um, and again, you can look at the 2011 um, Law Center report for that. But we did look at Supreme Court decisions, and there have only been two so far, specifically about homeless encampments. Um, the first is the Washington State decision. That was a very positive decision, um, which I referenced before. It was uh, sort of litigated under the state constitution's um, freedom of exercise of religion uh, provision. Um, there's a negative decision in Rhode Island that I uh, also referenced when I was discussing the Rhode Island um, case study. And um, as generally, the takeaway about state law is that sometimes it provides additional resources that can be used in addition to what's available under the Constitution or federal laws. Um, there is ongoing litigation in New Jersey, in Lakewood, New Jersey right now. Um, the parties are in settlement conversations, um, but it also has to do with the ability of the city to continue existing in, its, in the form that it's been existing so far. Okay, we also looked at international and regional law, uh, where we found that the right to housing is well established both as an enumerated right and as a component of a number of other rights. Many treaties uh, contain explicit reference to housing as a human right. Um, included among these are the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, the International Covenant of Economic and Social Rights, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the European Social Charter, which all provide a specific right to housing as part of the right to an adequate standard of living. The Committee on the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights uh, has recognized that the right to adequate housing applies to everyone and has further interpreted the right to adequate housing to include various components such as the legal security of tenure, the availability of services, materials, facilities, and infrastructure, affordability, habitability, accessibility, location, and cultural adequacy. Right to shelter has also been recognized as part of the right to life, uh, which is codified in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, and it's been interpreted by the Human Rights Council as including the right to shelter oneself from the elements. And forced evictions are also said to violate the right to life. The right to housing has also been interpreted as part of a freedom from cruel and degrading treatment as codified in the ICCPR. And in one case, the Committee Against Torture found that uh, the destruction of a Roma tent city in Montenegro constituted cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment under the ICCPR, and therefore implicated this right to housing. Rights to property, privacy, and shelter are established as a component of due process. The Universal Declaration and the ICCPR provide that no one shall be subject to arbitrary arrest or detention and consequently protect homeless individuals from unreasonable seizure based on the performance of survival activities in a public space. Article 17 of the ICCPR also protects homeless individuals' rights to own property and not to be arbitrarily deprived of that property. It extends the right to be free from arbitrary or unlawful interference with one's privacy, family, home, or correspondence, and gives protection by the law against such interference. Uh, forced evictions are also seen to fall under this nexus of the protection of property, housing, and privacy. Right to shelter has also been um, seen as being a component of anti-discrimination law. The Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination guarantees the right of everyone without distinction as to race, color, or national or ethnic origin 
to the enjoyment of the right to housing. In 2006, the Human Rights Council specifically raised the issue of disparate racial impact of homelessness on African American communities in the United States. There's also a right to free movement, which is um, encompassed in the Universal Declaration and the ICCPR, which basically can be extended to, um, to mean choice of residence as well for homeless individuals as well as other people. While Article 5 of the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination protects the right to freedom of movement and residence within the border of the state. A 2006 report by the former Special Rapporteur on Adequate Housing found that forced eviction specifically violates this human right to freedom of movement. There's also the right to shelter as a component of the right to family. Uh, since shelter and other housing systems tend to separate spouses and sometimes children, children from parents, this implicates the right to family, which is well established in numerous different treaties. Um, the equal rights of women is implicated in the housing debate as there's a disparate gender impact resulting from inadequate housing and homelessness. The ICCPR and the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women provide for equal treatment for women and protect against homelessness and lack of housing, which have this disparate impact. Women who suffered domestic violence are also at greater risk of becoming homeless, and once homeless, women tend to experience higher rates of physical and sexual violence. The right to participation, the right to access public places and services are also recognized in numerous treaties um, which have the right to participate in government and provide equal access to these public places and services. Um, previous special rapporteur reports note that homeless people rely heavily on public spaces for daily activities and that homeless people are increasingly isolated from mainstream society and public services. Finally, Article 28 of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities recognizes the right to housing of persons with disabilities and requires states to ensure access by persons with disabilities to public housing programs. Given that the United States has ratified the ICCPR and the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and is a signatory to many other of these treaties, the U.S. has, a, has an affirmative obligation not to infringe upon these freedoms and rights of homeless individuals. Forced evictions against tent city residents and tent city closures without the provision of adequate alternative or emergency housing in particular are implicated as violating both international and regional law. And while we won't have time to go into much detail today, we just wanted to quickly mention that we've also included in the report a section on comparative law uh, discussing constitutional legal developments in India, South Africa, Colombia, and Canada, including rights that are analogous to the rights that we just discussed uh, in the international and domestic context the right to housing, the right to emergency shelter, the right to use public space for shelter, and the right to meaningful participation in the resolution of housing needs. But for our closing, uh, concluding thoughts, we wanted to note that homelessness encampments, while often, uh, of course, a matter of necessity, are also a form of protest, a refusal to remain invisible. In tent cities, homeless individuals are able to constitute a community in which they can find companionship, respect, safety, autonomy, and a sense of dignity. But they remain adamant that tents are not the solution. No one willingly chooses to live in a tent. In responses to the failures of the, of the shelter system, of the provision of services to homeless individuals, and extrapolating from our field work and interviews of tent city residents, advocates, and community officials, and incorporating all of the observed best practices, we propose the following recommendations to be implemented by local, state, and federal governments. Number one, to increase the stock of affordable public housing with high quality and safety standards. Number two, while affordable housing is being constructed, legalize and provide infrastructure to su infrastructure support for tent city encampments. While municipal governments ought recognize that tent cities should never substitute for permanent housing or longer term investment in housing or service provision, they must tolerate the existence of encampments as results of failed public policy. Evictions of tent cities, tent cities must be halted until viable alternative housing is made available. Number three, repeal the counterproductive municipal ordinances that criminalize homelessness. These include ordinances concerning sleeping and reclining, sleeping in the right of way, outdoor storage of personal property, and panhandling. Moreover, certain ordinances, such as public urination, public intoxication, trespassing, and open container laws, should not be enforced against homeless individuals except in cases deemed absolutely necessary by local law enforcement in collaboration with outreach teams and social workers. Police officials should be aware that arrests and harassment of homeless persons only exacerbate the chronicity of homelessness. Number four, prioritize the autonomy and dignity of the homeless individual in the process of shelter provision and placement in affordable housing. Service provision and housing programs should be more responsive to the real needs and input of homeless individuals. Outreach programs that engage with homeless populations where they are, where they are and work 
uh, uh, work with them to find solutions collaboratively um, ought to be a priority. Activist and tent city residents reiterate that one of the great strengths and appeals of the tent city encampments is their bottom-up organization in which homeless individuals can find community and autonomy. This same model should be incorporated as much as feasible into the shelter and service provision systems. Relatedly, the role of uh, homeless representatives should be institutionalized in shelter uh, and service provision systems. And uh, six, the, the housing first model should be adopted wherever possible. Uh, these comprehensive measures of housing first help to ensure that formerly homeless individuals are able to stay in housing once they are placed into it and to maintain a sustainable lifestyle in new conditions. An important feature of the housing first model is the respect that it provides participants. Namely, the placement in housing comes with no conditions and the services, while available, are not mandatory. Number seven, support innovative, innovative entrepreneurial education and employment programs for the homeless. Such programs are focused on concrete programs to uh, concrete programs to, to employ homeless persons, to provide preliminary employment for, as a future reference, to teach the skills necessary to remain employed, and thereby to lift the homeless uh, individuals progressively from homelessness. And finally, to recognize and provide treatment for the psychological the causes of homelessness, including the trauma histories that often result diagnosable mental, mental illnesses. As a part of this recognition, municipalities should encourage and fund support for trauma-informed communities, in which business people, educators, civil society groups, and law enforcement recognize the central place of trauma in causing homelessness. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Paul, and uh, everybody from Yale. Uh, I think this is a really great uh, presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions, they can type them into their uh, the question box on their side panel now, and we'll read them and, and discuss them as well. Uh, Paul, can you advance to the next slide and share our contact information with folks? Um, uh, the, the information is now showing on the screen. If you have any specific questions, we are more than happy to answer them. Um, the report, when it becomes available, will be available on our website listed there, as well uh, as the 2011 Criminalizing Crisis Report that uh, several of the students mentioned is currently available there. That has a lot of collected information on um, criminalization policies, including policies that affect uh, tent encampments, um, as, uh, but a, a lot of other issues that affect uh, the criminalization of homelessness across the country, as well as our, our other human rights, um, civil rights, domestic violence, and education reports that the Law Center covers. Um, do we have any questions at this point, Andy? Uh, yes, we do. I'll just remind uh, our presenters uh, so that they can jump in, anyone who may have muted themselves. Go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. The first question is, uh, are there any best practices for initiating and sustaining sustaining a dialogue between private and public homeless service providers? Um, I'll take a first stab at that. Uh, if anybody else wants to chime in, please feel free. Um, the, uh, following the Occupy Eugene um, encampment, uh, the dismantling of that encampment, there was a, a condition placed by the organizers on their sort of peaceful exit from, um, from their encampment that a dialogue be initiated between both the public and private service providers and uh, public officials and homeless people in that community. Um, they set up a 90-day task force called the Opportunity Eugene Task Force um, to look at issues of homelessness um, in the community come up with a series of recommendations. It was uh, over 50 people were on the task force, again, from a full range of public, private, um, public and private entities, as well as uh, individuals. And they came up miraculously within their 90-day uh, time span with uh, consensus on a series of 14 recommendations that were then put to the city council and are now being considered. Um, I think that's uh, a, an excellent model for um, how things can be developed. Uh, and if folks are interested in that, if you uh, just Google Opportunity Eugene 
homeless task force. I'm sure you'll be able to find more information about that. Um, we're also uh, trying to get information about uh, the task force and its recommendations, which include recognizing housing as a human right and the consideration of different models for more permanent encampments, as well as a strong recommendation that the city manager examine all of the community's laws that potentially criminalize homelessness and work to mitigate their effects. Um, those recommendations, I believe, are already up on our wiki web website, which is uh, listed on, on the screen there uh, now under the, the right to housing uh, models section. Um, does anybody else want to jump in on that one? Um, yeah, this is Julie. It's also just worth mentioning that there was a pretty high degree of collaboration and, and constant communication between the city of New Orleans and the service providers in the city um, in the moving of residents out of the, the tent cities in New Orleans. And for people who are interested in, in how that partnership worked, it's, um, we can refer you to our report, or it's worth looking into um, news reports and um, more in-depth in, in study of what exactly happened in New Orleans. Uh, along those lines, I want to jump down to uh, a question Rob Robinson asked specifically about that. He says, uh, I visited the Calliope site in October 2011 and held a press conference with May Day New Orleans and Occupy New Orleans. It seems that as a result of the press conference, there was a bi-weekly effort by the city to clean the area. This process eventually led to the displacement of over 100 homeless persons. Uh, based on your findings or any recent contact you may have had, are folks being allowed to uh, once again reside under the I-10 overpass? Um, as far as, as we're aware, we're not aware of, of any move to move back to what sounds like the that sounds like the Canal and Claiborne location. Mm -hmm. um, but I would double check with with the representatives of Unity because they they have people on the ground who follow these things on a daily basis. Okay, great. Uh, next question. Uh, did your study include any on-site visits, and uh, are there any websites that deal with tent cities? Yeah, yeah. so all of our uh, field work, uh, we, we tried to get access to the, any existing tent cities uh, that were in the areas uh, were on-site visits. Uh, and so certainly we, we visited um, Pinellas Hope um, and certainly Safe Harbor. And then we actually also um, looked at some uh, some smaller tent communities north in in Pasco that we mentioned, um, and and then of course in Lakewood, New Jersey, uh, we did the same. Rhode Island, there were no existing tent cities, uh, and the same for uh, New Orleans, where there were existing tent cities, we have on-site visits, uh, and each I know Pinellas Hope and Pinellas Harp Safe Harbor each have websites that you can go to with some kind of limited information and some kind of pictures that you can see in addition to the ones that we included in our PowerPoint slides. Okay, great. Um, did you include squatting at all in the survey, or do you regard that as a separate issue? Um, if, by squatting, you mean uh, squatting in um, buildings um, you know, rather than erecting your own structure uh, on um, on public land, we did not include that as part of the survey. It was, it was um, specifically focused on uh, tent communities, obviously squatting um, in uh, abandoned or vacant um, properties is something that's on the rise uh, across the country as well as a kind of complement to um, tent cities. Uh, but uh, because of the unique challenges faced by people in ten communities, they are you know, more visible and um, uh, and they have you know additional challenges in terms of the lack of a, a permanent uh, adequate shelter over their head and um, some of the services and infrastructure and even in a lot of the uh, buildings that are being squatted in across the country, um, people can still get electricity and water hookups and things like that. So uh, those were not covered in this report, but we might take it into account and look at it in terms of uh, some an area for future study. 
I would also recommend that people check out some of Unity's publications on um, their annual abandoned building report in which they uh, profile and, and survey abandoned buildings in New Orleans um, and discuss the, uh, the problems that people face living in those buildings. Um, I think there's around 60,000 abandoned buildings, I want to say, and many, many people living in them who go undocumented every year except for service providers like Unity. So I'd really recommend checking out some of their publications. And uh, additionally, uh, Take Back the Land um, is doing an, uh, an affirmative campaign to look at use of abandoned properties um, owned by the, the federal government or by Fannie and Freddie as, as public property and moving people into them. If people are interested in that as a, uh, a model for activism, um, Take Back the Land uh, is, is uh, actively involved in that sort of thing um, and, uh, and is currently running campaigns. And, and just very briefly, just to, in the same kind of spirit, um, uh, many activists that we talked to in St. Petersburg, but, but most particularly GW Rawl, uh, has been very creative about uh, trying to involve homeless persons in, in fixing up abandoned buildings and trying to uh, get permission from the city to do so, uh, sometimes with, with more success than at other times. But um, it, it, it seems like it's, a, it's an area for potential involvement um, of homeless individuals really in, in, in using the, the abandoned buildings to uh, find employment uh, from the city and as well as they do so to find housing as well. Okay. Uh, how do the recommendations take into account community needs, preferences, and ownership in solving the problem? Um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, each community needs to approach um, the, the uh, addressing of tent cities in their own uh, communities uh, as, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis. All of the situations um, are different in terms of whether the uh, tent cities are, are more currently more sustainable or are in an, you know, unsustainable and sort of disorganized and unsafe model. Um, and, uh, but the, you know, one of the essential features, I think, of our recommendations is the inclusion of homeless people, of the residents of those 10 communities, uh, in the solutions to their problems so that it's not just people who aren't living there, uh, making decisions about what people who are in those, uh, 10 cities are going to have to uh, experience and do and, and develop solutions outside of uh, their input. Um, but uh, so it, it should be a whole community solution. Um, one of the important things uh, that we don't address deeply in this report but is addressed further in the criminalizing crisis report um, is the fact that constructive solutions to uh, homelessness often are both better in terms of ensuring people's basic human rights are upheld, but also are financially better for communities. It costs far more to arrest a person, process them through the justice system, house them in a jail or a prison, um, and then put additional barriers in front of them in terms of having an arrest record to their getting permanent housing or to getting employment and you know returning to uh, a productive role in society, then, then it does actually just house them um, to provide adequate shelter, to legalize a tent community, and provide adequate services. So while there are some you know, initial upfront costs to uh, shelter provision, to housing first models, to just uh, you know, providing basic sanitation facilities at a homeless encampment, um, many cities would see actual savings in terms of reduction of public safety budgets in uh, regards to the costs to um, the health care system and uh, homeless people needing to access emergency health care services um, uh, if they were to take a constructive approach, involve all the appropriate uh, stakeholders and um, 
can come up with constructive alternatives. The federal government has just issued, the U.S. Air Agency Council on Homelessness just this uh, past month issued a report on constructive alternatives to the criminalization of homelessness that we and a number of other groups uh, worked on. Um, that report's called Searching Out Solutions, and it's available on the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness website, uh, usich.gov. Um, and that report is also notable in that it recognizes, um, so far as we're aware for the first time, that the uh, criminalization of homelessness does implicate uh, both domestic and international human rights standards, uh, notably uh, our rights under the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Convention Against Torture and other forms of cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment or punishment. Um, so that report, as well as our Criminalizing Crisis report, uh, which contains a, an activist toolkit in it, um, are both uh, available for folks looking for you know, constructive solutions uh, for their communities. And, and just to give you a, a particular example, uh, you know, communities are, are doing this economic uh, calculus, uh, this in addition to the sheer numbers of uh, homeless, uh, uh, the rest of homeless persons was one of the main reasons why Pinal Safe Harbor was finally uh, funded uh, by, by the, the government. Um, and specifically, both, I think both Pinal's Hope and Pinal Safe Harbor uh, worked very, very hard to create buy-in among the, the local community. As you saw, we saw on that map in the surrounding neighborhoods where these uh, shelters were, uh, or communities were located, um, uh, the institutional officials uh, who ran uh, this, the shelters worked hard uh, to really contact the, the community to make them aware of what was going on, to assure them uh, of that, that they would be would continue to be informed and uh, both to seek out kind of economic and employment opportunities for shelter residents. Um, and they worked with, with police uh, as well to provide extra policing um, at, at the beginning when, when individual and when, when neighbors might have feared that um, uh, how the, the, the influx of this new homeless uh, population might affect uh, their daily lives. Uh, and so I think that there was a very careful and constructive approach in contacting and reaching out to neighborhood associations and really taking the time to have uh, community meetings uh, where exactly the plans uh, were, were really uh, made clear. I would also note that um, although not one of the case studies that we covered, um, uh, the, there are several tent cities in uh, Washington state um, that have been developed in close con consultation with the communities. Um, uh, some of the uh, Nicholsville encampments in Seattle, Washington that uh, rotate between various communities on an ongoing basis, um, as well as in Puyallup, Washington, um, where different uh, religious organizations or educational organizations host um, small tent cities uh, for a period of three or four months at a time. Um, having that rotating model of uh, Intensities, while it presents some logistical challenges for the, the people who are actually residing in those camps, um, can reduce community opposition to the camps um, because they know people know that they won't be in the community for a long time. But also, they uh, allow more people to be involved uh, from the community in helping to service the community. Um, a lot of these ten communities, once they are located in a given area and people know that they're there. Um, people from the community do come out and volunteer, give um, meals, give uh, you know ser other services uh, to the people living in the camps. People begin to realize that homeless people uh, aren't necessarily uh, the stereotypical image that they've been accustomed to, but uh, they get to know the people in the camps. And so having that rotating model can actually build a broader support network for um, the, the people in the camps and how educate more people in broader uh, range of the community about um, what the needs of the people living in the camps are. So um, the National Coalition for the Homeless has produced an uh, a excellent report on West Coast tent cities um, in 2009, and that's available on their website. 
um, at the National Coalition for the Homeless, and um, that uh, that summarized some of the uh, practices um, and has some of the contact information for the um, the folks who helped to develop some of those ten cities in Washington State. There was a uh, request to repeat the name of the federal report Eric referenced, and again, for anyone who missed it, that's uh, Searching Out Solutions. It was put out by the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness and the Department of Justice. Uh, if you go to the news section on our website, there's a link there, or just a Google search will turn that up uh, quickly for you. Um, there's a question uh, from someone who says they're not able to refer to housing as a human right in the homelessness education they do, uh, are there any recommendations of how to frame it similarly without uh, directly calling it a human right? Um, well, I think, uh, you know, some of the hesitation to call housing a human right um, might, uh, you know, obviously people know their communities best and uh, should go with that, but um, people might be surprised to know that about three quarters of Americans agree that housing is a basic human right. Um, it's you know much more prevalent than one might think. Um, so uh, some of that hesitance might be misplaced, uh, you know, uh, depending on what community you're in, and, and maybe it's worth uh, trying to do it. Um, and it's worth noting also that this concept of housing as a human right. Uh, isn't a foreign concept. It's something that was very much based um, uh, on the ideals proposed by uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in his Four Freedoms speech, as well as the Atlantic Charter, um, and Eleanor Roosevelt's drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, so it's not that uh, you, you can dispel some of sort of the um, anti-internationalist sentiment by referring to those American origins of the human right to housing um, and uh, and really ground it in, in our American tradition of what we value as Americans. We don't, we believe in freedom and uh, equality and the chance for everybody to have uh, an equal opportunity to succeed um, and uh, we as Americans don't believe that our neighbors um, you know, here in the wealthiest country in the world uh, should be living in essentially third world conditions, um, you know, without access to adequate sanitation or water uh, in these 10 communities. We as Americans can and should do better um, in our communities. Uh, so that, you know, might address some of those concerns. Um, uh, beyond that, you know, you don't have to necessarily reference specific treaty rights. You don't have to say uh, this comes from uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Again, you can just um, say we as, as Americans um, you know, think that we can and, and should do better by, uh, by our fellow citizens. We don't believe that people should be criminalized simply because they don't have a home. Uh, you know, activities that everybody else takes for granted, sleeping, eating, drinking, all of these things, even going to the bathroom, things that people are perfectly legal to do if you have a roof over your head. If you don't, um, you know, they're basic uh, life-sustaining practices. Uh, they shouldn't be against the law for any person to, ha um, and people shouldn't have to uh, face the threat of arrest just for trying to lay their head down at night, something that everybody else, you know, has to do as well. So um, some of those kind of humanizing, um, that humanizing framing can help people start thinking about the real human impact of, uh, of criminalization or of, uh, of what you know, homeless people have to endure every day. Um, and then always drawing it back to this kind of concept of uh, the essential inherent human dignity of every person that we as Americans believe that uh, you know we have certain obligations to our fellow citizens uh, to make sure that, that that basic human dignity is ensured. This is Hope Metcalf. Um, I'm one of the supervisors from Yale. Um, I, 
what Eric said all makes so much sense. The other thing I would just toss in is, you know, we don't have debtors' prisons in the U.S. I mean, we kind of do, but we're not supposed to. Um, and that's a really old American principle that goes back to the founding of the nation. For the same reason, I think you could talk to uh, the average American about the idea that simply um, performing basic human necessities and being punished for it uh, is un-American. And it's, um, it also, all those things like Eric said, draw on the basic principle of individual worth and dignity, which also happens to be expressed in human rights, but it is an American concept as well. So I, I think you can wrap this in the flag um, of American values as well. And I just want to also say that in, in our report, um, and certainly in the case studies, we uh, explicitly made it a goal of ours to ask every person that we interviewed whether they believe that housing uh, is a human right. And we've collected uh, some of the answers that were given uh, at the end of our report. So that's something to, to maybe look for. And in some ways, uh, one kind of issue that kept on cropping up and this is related to the idea of invoking dignity, but it's really the idea that, that housing seems to be so central to a whole host of the enjoyment of other rights that we would expect. Um, and it's, it's expressed in the quotes in various different ways from um, you know, a couple individuals noted that it's really a, a right to be safe uh, and it's a right to have a home, to, to call uh, some place your home and to feel that you can be uh, healthy uh, physically and emotionally uh, within that place. So I think there's many ways to kind of understand what housing actually means uh, practically. And we really try to write the case studies themselves uh, so as to, to really craft the narrative uh, for what, what, how these tensities emerged, why they emerged, and to tell some of the more personal stories of the people who were responsible uh, for their lives. Um, so I hope, I hope that, that when you see the final report, that might help in terms of framing the issue and, and talking about it in some way. Okay. Uh, we have a question that I think uh, is referring to homeless children's education protections uh, for tent cities. Uh, used as an alternative to housing, uh, are families identified uh, as homeless under McKinney-Vento? Uh, yes, they, they most definitely would be. It's uh, um, the definition of homelessness in McKinney-Vento is any you know uh, any child. Okay, great. Um, let's see here. Uh, we have a comment and question. I understand and agree that permanent encampments are important and crucial to improve the survival of uh, homeless individuals where the welfare system has failed. My question is how one can prevent uh, that such permanent camps become exploitable substandard places of residence uh, where poor and homeless persons are forced to stay because there's no alternative. Uh, they will, uh, you know, social services might intervene and either take the children away or they would work uh, more quickly to find the family's housing um, together with their children. Um, but I think there are a lot of situations um, of, rather than large-scale densities, you know, one or two um, or three families camping together trying to remain unseen, um, where you would find uh, homeless children, um, homeless students uh, in in a tent situation, and um, and those students should definitely be identified and given services um, under the McKinney Vento Education Right components. Uh, I apologize. I think we had a brief uh, audio uh, cut off there, but I think the the gist of uh, Eric's point uh, got across. Um, with another comment, it seems obvious that bottom-up organized tent cities are more efficient for provision of services, uh, i.e. outreach, transportation, uh, mental health visitation. Uh, do you have any survey results that would provide uh, empirical support for that position? We, we don't. Uh, uh, we didn't. Um we didn't look specifically at that, although it would obviously um, seem to make sense. Um, and I think that um, some of the, I think uh, talking with 
some of the folks who are running these uh, 10 communities, um, especially Lakewood, New Jersey, I think we, we heard some uh, information about uh, people receiving services um, at that site, as well as uh, similar, you know, services are provided um, at Canales Hope. Um, I think talking with those folks might be able to turn up some of that uh, empirical information if they're collecting it. Uh, there's an interesting question here. Are there any examples of tent cities that actually receive mail for residents? Um, I, I don't know if uh, I, Pinellas Hope, do you know? Yeah. yeah, I was about to say that, that I, I believe that Pinellas Hope does get uh, mail delivery uh, for, the, for, the certain, for the guests that are, for the residents that are, have registered. Uh, as well as the, as well the safe harbor. yeah safe harbor as well so it it is a place that provides a relatively speaking more more stability in terms of people looking for jobs or needing to take care of paperwork to get a social security card that sort of thing and I would say obviously it's probably only the ones that are have some sort of formal legal status that that's able to be done at uh, you know otherwise it would be um, very difficult to, you know, have that verifiable regular address that um, people could send things to. And uh, as uh, um, as Stuart said at the beginning of the presentation, of all of the uh, over a hundred uh, sites that were mentioned uh, in the media surveys, only eight of them had that more regular, legal, or semi-legal, regularized status. Okay. Um, do you have any suggestions for housing alternatives for sex offenders living in uh, camps or tent cities? Um, this is Hope. Uh, that seems like I, we're glad to have Eric comment. That seems like an incredibly important um, question given the way that they are penalized and kind of written out of various city uh, whole, whole swaths of city land. Um, it's not something that we focused on. Um, I mean, I think that the best suggestion would be to change um, the housing restrictions on sex offenders so that there are more options available to them. Yeah, I would, um, again, it's not an area of uh, my particular expertise, but I would, um, I think it may be covered in part on, in our criminalizing crisis report uh, on our website, or folks can get in touch with our civil rights uh, attorney, Heather Johnson, um, and the contact information is, uh, you know, on our website, or you can call our our phone number listed there and ask to be connected to Heather. Um, she would be uh, the one to who might know more about that. Okay, uh, you addressed squatting in the context of existing housing, but what about tent cities being set up on public property? Uh, how did public perceptions and legal action uh, differ uh, when it was public versus private property? Well, I think um, most of the sites that we were looking at were on um, on public property, um, and most of the ones that were covered in the in the survey were also public property. Um, it, uh, can, do you want to speak to the, the specific sites you guys looked at? Yeah. Uh, yes. So, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Julie. Oh, okay. In, in New Orleans, I think um, all the sites were public property. And I think there were forceful evictions, not forceful evictions, but evictions by the city um, at the point when people had been moved into permanent supportive housing. and. In Lakewood, I think it's also the tent city is also on public property, hence the lawsuit um, between the town and the tent city. Paul, do you want to? Yeah, and then in terms of St. Petersburg, the the, the tent cities that were evicted uh, from the period that I spoke about at the very beginning, um, around 2007, basically, were all on public property. And then Pinellas uh, Safe, Pinellas Hope, was actually uh, land that was uh, given. Um, for the, the purpose by the diocese. They were working in conjunction, conjunction with the municipal government. And obviously, Pinellas Safe Harbor is, is, a, is a municipal institution. Um, I think uh, 
one of some of the comparative examples um, are also interesting in this regard. Uh, in South Africa, there is a constitutional right to housing um, and legislation protecting um, people from being evicted into homelessness. So squatter communities there, um, even you know where they are on public or private property, uh, the state needs to ensure that they have viable alternatives provided to them before they can go ahead and evict them. Um, and there's a number of really interesting cases um, uh, that have come out of the constitutional courts in South Africa uh, around that, uh, that concept. Um, so that's working, worth looking at um, as a, a comparative example. We had a uh, request to repeat the website that has the activism toolkit info. You see on the last slide there, wiki.nlchp.org will have a lot of those materials uh, specifically related to the criminalization of homelessness. There's a self-advocacy manual uh, which uh, composes the second half of criminalizing crisis. If you go to nlchp.org, you can click on the Criminalizing Crisis Report in a sidebar on the right side of the screen. Um, there is a, another interesting question from Alan Moore. Are you aware of any discourse analysis type studies on the demonization of homelessness, uh, specifically the stereotypes that lead to repressive laws like the one you guys have been describing? Um, I'm not aware of any of those specifically, um, but uh, I'm sure there are, there may be some out there. But no, I'm I'm not particularly aware of anything off the top of my head. Um, one thing, one thought on that, which is that we we did not uh, kind of do a re, uh, review of. Uh, research or literature in that area, but certainly what you say resonates in terms of the various conversations that were had with a whole array of stakeholders. And as Paul was mentioning earlier, it's something that um, that idea uh, of kind of the fear on the part of the general public member, especially business owners in the St. Pete area, was something that was very much on the mind of policymakers. Um, and so when the two large city programs, um, Pinellas Hope and Safe Harbor, were being established, there was a big effort to do a lot of community roundtables, et cetera. And one of the service providers also um, that was one of the main kind of coalition members organizing those two efforts, um, they were doing a lot of outreach um, with um, currently or formerly homeless folks talking to various community groups, church organizations, et cetera. So um, there was a very um, uh, self-conscious um, attempt to break down some of those stereotypes directly. Yeah, and, and specifically, we talked with, uh, with April a lot, who is, um, who is head of the, one of the organizations in uh, homeless advocacy organizations in, in St. Petersburg. And she specifically brought up this notion of these trauma-informed communities and really kind of uh, educational programs uh, you know, aimed at um, business people, educators, civil society groups to really kind of uh, help understand uh, what are the on the side of, of, of mental illness and kind of the, the role of trauma in in, in, um, in originating uh, the illness and causing uh, homelessness, and to kind of be more informed about this angle and how communities can respond more adequately to that. So that if you want to, uh, we, that's again that's included in the, in the report. And um, we can kind of go, we go more into more detail and provide, provide contact information for that group as well. Okay, one particularly I think good and relevant question: uh, Do tent city residents anywhere have rights that are uh, similar to tenants' rights? Uh, as I recall, Eric, uh, you took a trip to South Africa a couple years ago and observed something along those lines there. Right, like I was saying or in, in terms of the comparative examples. Um, in South Africa, uh, before a tent city um, or you know, a shantytown um, resident can be evicted, well, before the community can be evicted, um, there needs to be um, adequate alternatives provided 
to the residents, um, and that's uh, both for people who are um, squatting in, in things they have constructed themselves on public or private land, or people who are occupying vacant buildings. Um, in uh, in Canada, the um, you know there uh, is this case uh, from British Columbia that says homeless people need to be given the right to shelter themselves where there is no uh, adequate alternative. Um, but in the U.S., in terms of anything um, like that, you know th there are uh, there's the Pottinger case that says that um, uh, you know you can't uh, enforce criminal ordinances against um, homeless people when uh, uh, you know for conducting basic life-sustaining activities when there aren't adequate alternatives. Um, but there's, uh, so far as I'm aware of, um, aside from the communities that have formally kind of uh, become sanctioned by the communities, had ordinances passed that set up uh, sanctioned ways for those communities to exist, um, whether it's something like the, the permanent structures of um, Pinellas Hope or uh, um, uh, the rotating structures uh, that I mentioned before from Washington State. Um, I don't think there's anything uh, that is more akin to the, the tenants' rights that, that we would see where people have the right to some either form of adequacy or habitability or to the legal security of tenure to stay in their place um, until some alternative is provided. Um, you know, the, certainly the folks in uh, Lakewood, New Jersey, in their uh, opposition, uh, their legal opposition to their uh, the proposed eviction um, that the city uh, and the county were trying to enforce on them, um, they did bring up some of those kinds of concepts and uh, said that the, um, the, they should have a right to remain for a variety of different reasons. Um, but I don't think anything like that has been formalized in U.S. law that I'm aware of. Okay, I think we have time for just one more. Uh, did you come across evictions or attempted evictions led by state uh, departments of transportation uh, when the tent cities were near state roads or bridges? Um, this is Julie. Uh, in the New Orleans situation, uh, I don't believe that was the case. I think the eviction efforts were um, probably led by city officials in general. Uh, I don't know if there was any input from the Department of Transportation, but I'm not sure as to other places. Yeah, in the other cases, mostly police. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, uh, Stuart, if you have any specific uh, cases you can recall. I know that a number of cases um, in California and in Washington State, I believe, um, have been done by uh, State Department of Transportation officials, uh, both near railway lines um, or uh, underpasses, or, or you know, I think even water departments where people are uh, living in um, you know the sort of underpasses or, or rain gutter areas. Um, so that's definitely a, a practice that. Um, does happen, but uh, we didn't look extensively at it in the report. Um, if there's specific questions about it, people can definitely feel free to to be in contact uh, through through the contact information on the screen. Um, Stuart, do you have anything you want to say? Okay, I you've lost uh, Stuart there. Uh, yeah, just reiterate. Uh, uh, thank uh, you. Oh, uh, sorry, I, I didn't realize I had, uh, I guess, double muted my phone. Um, <laughs> can you can you repeat the question? Sure. The, the question was about the use of um, state uh, transportation um, officials as being the enforcers uh, of any evictions for the ten communities, especially along state highways or, or other things like that. Uh, right, yeah, I've definitely um, definitely seen that. I don't recall every instance 
I think in some cases um, they conduct the uh, the eviction or they ask the local authorities. Uh, they, they notify the local authorities and ask the authorities uh, to do the eviction. Okay. And again, if anybody has any specific questions about that, um, feel free to, to contact us at the information on the screen. Um, as I noted before, the report should be coming out uh, within the next month or so, um, depending on how things go on our end. And um, there are a number of resources already in existence. Uh, our Criminalizing Crisis Report, our Human Right to Housing Report, both uh, are uh, prominently uh, displayed on our main website, uh, which you can link to from the link on screen right now. Um, as well as the National Coalition for the Homeless's uh, report on West Coast Tent Cities and the U.S. Interagency Council and Department of Justice's report on the uh, alternatives to criminalization of homelessness. Um, so those reports are out there. Um, our report on Tent Cities will be coming uh, soon, and uh, we encourage everybody to um, be in touch with us if they have any questions. You should be getting notification of the report when it comes out. Um, you will probably receive a uh, request for an evaluation of this webinar um, and feel free to use that to both suggest specific things on the presentation as well as future uh, avenues of research that we might want to undertake um, and uh, for, for future reports. I'll just add that uh, full audio and video of the presentation including the question and answer portion should be uh, available on our website by the end of the week, so keep a look out for that. Well, then I'll just conclude by saying thank you so much to our partners um, at Yale and at Dixie and Shapiro. Um, thanks to all the attendees, and uh, we look forward to hearing from all of you in the future. Thank you.